Well, good morning and welcome everyone to the 27th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they affect the, the broadcasting system. And I'm about to point out some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting as meeting papers are provided in a digital format. Now, we have apologies this morning from Jim Eady, who's ill, and from Maureen Watt. And since our last meeting, Maureen has moved on to Pastors New as Deputy, uh, and, uh, so as Deputy Convener, I'll be chairing today's meeting. Uh, I'm sure all members will join with me in congratulating Maureen on her appointment as Minister for Public Health and also to thank her for her convenership of this committee over the past three and a half years. Agreed. Um, now, the first uh, item for today is to seek the agreement of the committee to take items three and four in private. Item three is to consider a list of candidates for the post of Freight Inquiry Advisor and item four is to consider a draft report to the Finance Committee on the draft budget. Uh, do members agree to take these mm -hmm. items in private? Thank you very much. Move on to agenda item two, and uh, we're here to uh, hear evidence from a number of stakeholders on the Scottish Housing Regulators Annual Report and the operation of the regulatory regime. And today, I welcome Tony Kane, Head of Housing and Customer Service in Stirling Council, representing the Association of, of Local Authority uh, Chief Housing Officers, and uh, David Bookbinder, uh, Director, Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, and Alan Stokes, uh, Policy Manager of Scottish Federation of Housing uh, Associations. So I think we'll, we'll just launch straight into questions, gentlemen. And if I can ask the first question, which is, in general, how well do you think the regulator is performing against its statutory objective to safeguard and promote the interests of current and future tenants, homeless people, and other people who use services provided by social landlords? Um, I'd say, first of all, that we, uh, strong regulation, robust regulation, is, is critical to, to our sector as, as, as housing associations. The credibility that it gives us amongst tenants, amongst people who may become tenants of, of associations, and amongst lenders and other funders is absolutely critical. So uh, that, the, the notion of, of, of a robust regulatory regime is never in question, and, and anything, any any. Uh, criticisms that we may pass in the course of this morning and, and, and not in any way meant to uh, undermine that notion that we, we must have and, and welcome strong, strong regulation. We've, we've highlighted in our uh, submission to the committee a number of areas where we think uh, which have re gone, gone, gone well and, and have stood the regulator above some of its previous regimes. Uh, the, 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 uh, the content and accessibility, for instance, of some of its corporate communications on its website, uh, the availability of information, the accessibility of the charter information. That obviously, this autumn has seen the first uh, charter information from all uh, uh, housing association and local authority landlords. That that's available to anyone, and, and most importantly, tenants uh, through through a very accessible. Uh, comparison tool that you can use on on the regulator's website. So, um, uh, strengths there. Uh, uh, good good consultation prior to that on on what how they would measure the charter. Uh, very very consultative approach from the regulator that I think was widely welcomed. Um, we also welcome the notion that that there's really good intention be, be, behind the regulator's efforts to try and avoid where it can going straight into using statutory sort of formal inquiry powers where, where they perceive that there's a problem with an association. That when you do go down that formal route, you, you can trigger a lot of intervention, for instance, from lenders, which could result, have immense uh, financial implications for a housing association. So there's good intent behind that wish to avoid that formal route. 
The trouble is we're then left with um, no ground rules in relation to what the uh, uh, more informal engagement is. And that's a problem because nobody quite knows what to expect. And we have had uh, a, a, a lot of worrying feedback from members over the course of the last uh, uh, couple of years. And it's, it's, it's issues like uh, you know, regulators having meetings with associations that, that have no agenda, that aren't minuted, people coming out of those meetings un unsure of what was discussed, what was agreed, um, whistleblowing allegations, which of course uh, uh, the regulator uh, uh, of course has to look into, but, but which, which, which the association never knows what those allegations are because they've not been put in writing by the, by the regulator. Um, uh, and and a, a, an obsessive preoccupation uh, with uh, insisting or putting a lot of pressure on associations to appoint particular consultants um, that the regulator favours. So, in other words, where an association is, it, it does have to appoint an independent consultant to look into a, uh, uh, whether there's a problem or, or, or a problem that's already been identified. We've heard from many members who come under intense pressure to appoint particular consultants uh, recommended by the regulator. Um, and almost always English consultants and almost always costing well in excess of £1,000 a day of, of tenants' money. So, uh, the, these issues, in terms of the manner of communication, um, combined with the fact that there's no right of review or appeal, mean that, that, that this under-the-radar style of informal engagement uh, le leaves us all bereft of, of ground rules. And it's not in the spirit of the um, Scottish Government's recent consultation on a code of practice for all Scottish regulators, uh, which, which promotes openness, transparency, and, uh, um, amongst other things, a, a, a right of appeal. We're having good discussions at the moment with the regulator, constructive discussions to address some of these issues, but the worrying thing is that some of the communication style that I'm talking about is ongoing uh, whilst we're having these discussions. OK, we'll pick up some of these issues, in particular of transparency, um, later on with our questions. Alan, you want to? First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting the SFHA along here today to um, give evidence regarding the Scottish Housing Regulator. And like David, I think I'd like to start off by just saying how crucial um, regulation actually is for housing associations and cooperatives in Scotland. And as such, it's important that the SHR and the sector have a constructive relationship. Um, regulation provides assurances to tenants, service users, lenders and other stakeholders that the highest standards are appropriately maintained. Uh, now, we actually conducted a survey of our membership as part of our evidence and we gained some positive feedback about the role the SHR is playing. Um, however, we also received some constructive criticism of the SHR um, with the intention of improving the effectiveness of the regulated regime. Um, we'd be happy actually to host a, a further Chatham House meeting between members of the ICI committee and our membership if the committee wishes to hear examples directly from the sector. Um, I think there is a reluctance for our members to stick their head above the parapet if they're going to be critical of the SHR, so it might be helpful if you're looking for more specific examples, um, if, if you'd be interested in doing that. Um, whereas the SHR needs to be targeted where uh, it's needed the most, it can't base its view of the sector only on the most negative examples. Um, the vast majority of RSLs are well-run uh, organisations, and as the SHR has such an important role in maintaining the reputation of the sector, it should also play a prominent role in promoting its excellent performance. Um, and like David, we believe that the introduction of an independent appeal mechanism would be an excellent step forward in improving the transparency and accountability of the regulatory framework. Um, but specifically on the question you asked about the um, regulator's statutory objective, um, the feedback of our survey, um, which we received uh, 30 responses to, which is pro approximately a quarter of our membership, and it was a broad base of different organisations right across the country, and also urban and rural, so it was, it was probably quite representative of our, our membership. Um, about two-thirds felt that the regulator was meeting the statutory objective, um, but there was a caveat sort of added to that that they felt perhaps there was a, a heavy-handed approach in the way that the regulator was going about it. Um, there's a sense that maybe the regulator sometimes tars the sector with the same brush. Um, unfortunately, that you are always going to get a few organisations here and there that 
perhaps are not, are, are not going to perform the best, and that's where the regulator needs to be targeted. However, if it then views the whole sector in the same way, um, it's perhaps not, not being fair on the, the sector's performance as a whole. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much what we had for that, that question anyway. Okay, I think it's worth saying that we, we, have, we had invited tenants' representative groups uh, to today's meeting, but unfortunately none could accept the invitation, but we've asked for written, written evidence uh, from them as to how they see the regulator performing in terms of promotion of uh, tenants' rights, etc. So, uh, Tony, do you want to... Uh, yeah, I, I think the, our experience in the local authority sector of the regulator, it, it's a less obvious presence. I don't, that's not meant to be a criticism of any sort, but it, is, it isn't as... Its, it's, its range of engagement with us is narrower, and as a consequence, uh, our range of concerns around what, what it's likely to be doing is, is slightly narrower than colleagues in the housing association sector where the, the regulator has a more comprehensive remit. Over the piece, I would have scored 7 out of 10. I think the regulator is, just, just to make things fairly direct and simple, uh, has gone through a period of quite considerable change, has seen some substantial reduction in its resources over the last couple of years, and that has resulted and required a big adjustment in the way it does its business. I would agree that there are some issues in the way in which the regulator can communicate. Some of the discipline and precision uh, in that communication has been uh, lost with the, the reduction in resources. And, and I think some of the disciplines around... Um, engagements, recording, reporting, and publishing, uh, and particularly the timescales around uh, those, those uh, publishing reports have become a little less critical to the organisation. I was asked earlier on if I should declare an interest. I worked for one of the regulator's predecessors for four years as an inspection manager, and we were very clear that our engagement with the sector was very precise in terms of its timing, uh, and when we say we do things, we will do them. So we will issue reports, we will issue documents, we will uh, arrive and do our work at particular times in a disciplined and structured way. Some of that has gone. And a couple of best examples would be one we've seen only one, I think, public report in the local authority sector from own authority in Stirling. There was six or seven months between the on-site activity and the publication, by which time when we report the, to members we have actioned all the actions. Members are retrospectively approving a completed action plan rather than getting a chance to scrutinise uh, the actual report itself. So that delay, I think, was problematic for us. Um, and, and the other example would be the, the length of time it took to get the uh, uh, housing options thematic uh, published. Now, a really important report, an excellent piece of work. I think it was a, uh, added substantially to the debate about where we are going with housing options and, uh, and home services to homeless people in general. However, it took some time to get it published, and I think that uh, weakened some of the conversations and some of the investigations, some of the, the um, engagement around that. But on the whole, as I say, 7 out of 10, the regulator is working hard. It's adjusted its position over the last uh, couple of years. I think the work around the Charter has been particularly important, and I expect now having the first Charter reports and the comparative reports that we will see a little bit more targeted engagement around the local authority sector based on that information. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Perhaps if, if I can ask you to focus on um, tenants, homeless people, etc., service users here, uh, and ask the question in maybe in a wee bit different way. Can you identify any future risks to tenants, homeless people, and other service users from the way that the regulator currently performs its, its functions? I think the, it, again, in the local authority sector in particular, because the regulator is in, necessarily engaging with a range of other uh, inspection and regulation organisations, the quality of that engagement will be critical to its ability to um, develop a position and defend the interests of tenants and other service users. So homelessness in particular, I think there, are, there remain some issues around the homeless, delivery of homelessness services, particularly in relation to engagement with mental health services uh, and social care services, where there are gaps in the provision and there are service users who suffer as a consequence. I think it's, it has been quite difficult for the regulator to get underneath that gap and to start teasing that conversation out because it, well, it would require it to do that in conjunction with the Care Commission and, and uh, the Social Work Regulator as well. Uh, and I think that's proved more difficult. But also, I, I suspect, because um, as providers, local authorities have been a little bit slower, perhaps, than we ought to have been to examine some of the... Uh, harder-edged issues that impact on the most vulnerable of service users in the homelessness system. 
I think it's a question of balance. Uh, clearly, it's, it wouldn't be in tenants' interests if a housing association was, was in serious trouble, financial trouble, or, or, or very, very, very uh, serious govern governance issues. So, in that sense, you understand the regulator when, when, when it says we're protecting tenants' interests by make, try, doing what we can to make sure this housing association is, is or becomes uh, in better health. But th there is a balance there because there, 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 there have been cases where, in our members' view, um, the, the treatment of the association ha hasn't been proportionate and you then run the risk that the association could end up spending uh, thousands of pounds, potentially hundreds of thousands of pounds, looking into an issue, appointing consultants, etc., um, which, which has a real, a real direct cost for tenants. It's only tenants that are paying for that. So that, that, that means it's really important for the regulator to get it right in terms of being proportionate. Otherwise, there's a danger of, of, of actually acting against tenants' interests. But it, 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 it's a balance, and I think sometimes that, that, that's not been achieved. Follow that up in a minute, uh, David. Yeah, I, th I think I would just I would back up exactly what David said. Um, there is a risk if the regulator is getting bogged down on not trivial matters, but but less uh, less strategic matters that it could miss something more important elsewhere, which certainly would not be in the interest of tenants at all. And of course, the the main thing is that um, any cost of regulation is paid for by tenants ultimately, because that's where the rent money would go. Well, um, my understanding is, uh, from both from your evidence, uh, written evidence and others, were, was that the housing regulator was particularly concerned with governance in this uh, first period. Um, perhaps an overemphasis in governments, um, according to uh, some of your evidence uh, here, and that's something that we can follow up with the regulators when they, they come through. I note, though, that in uh, their annual report, um, the, what they call their emerging issues and our priorities for 2014-15, uh, the, the first bullet point that they have down is we, we think it is important that social landlords keep rents affordable for tenants and we are asking those with business plans based on above inflation rent rises to consider whether this is sustainable given the financial challenges tenants face. And we know all about the, the welfare reform issues that, uh, that people are facing as well. Um, it would seem to me that this is a particularly relevant priority for a regulator to focus on. Would you agree with that? I, I don't think any, whilst it came out of the blue initially in March this year when, when the regulator first made statements about uh, the, the need for associations and local authorities to be confident that the rent uh, increases that, 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 that were, were, were being, uh, uh, that were basically in place in a number of, in a number of uh, certainly at housing associations, I, I won't, I'll let Tony speak for local authorities, um, were based on a formula that was about above inflation increases for, 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 in some cases, up to 30 years. In raising that issue, uh, I, think, I think we felt uh, that this, this, this is perfectly reasonable for the, for the regulator to ask that, and it, it equally as it's, as it's right that associations look at themselves and say, are we, are we happy that that's sustainable for our tenants and those who will become our tenants in the longer term? I would say that I think that there is a risk that in raising the issue, the regulator has sort of chapped the door and run away. Uh, in the sense that this is a big, complex issue and that it, it's been raised, but where that's now going, you know, you might expect the regulator to be saying a little bit more about, well, what is an affordable rent? What criteria should an association look at? So we don't, you know, we're quite accepting of, of the regulator's raising of the issue, but there is a sense that it's kind of, it's thrown something into the fire and then, and then st stood, stood aside, but quite legitimate for it to raise the issue. I think to some extent that's a very fair comment. It was uh, Michael Cameron, the chief executive, who at, uh, uh, at the CIH conference this year um, introduced into his presentation a, a very simple uh, proposition that housing associations and landlords should be moving away, should be moving away from inflation plus uh, formula and should be uh, focusing, developing rent uh, proposals based on costs uh, and service proposals. 
an important point. It wasn't the worst place to make it. Perfectly legitimate, I think, to make it in that uh, in that uh, in that forum. Interestingly enough, from my point of view, it reflected exactly the conversation we'd had in, in Stirling and the approach that we have now taken to, to rents or had agreed prior to that, prior to March. I think the issue is that, yes, having thrown that in, having raised it, there's, then been, there's been very little follow-up. There's been no further conversation about it. Uh, we haven't seen any guidance on that. We haven't seen any engagement across the sector more generally on that. I think in the local authority sector, and I, I think that, that is a very fair point, in the local authority sector, it plays differently because our rent setting processes are slightly different than our financial arrangements and the, the oversight of our financial arrangements are rather different. But I think in that context, there would there is probably some benefit for the regulator to get a better handle on financial planning in local authorities, the extent to which the business planning disciplines that were pioneered in the housing association sector are now being used. And they're not universally used uh, in the local authority sector, uh, and they probably should be. Uh, but also, I think, in that context, the Scottish Government's recently published guidance on transparency in the management of housing revenue accounts is a fairly critical piece of guidance. And I think the regulator ought to be in a position to understand what it means and how it plays through in financial decision making in local authorities, even if that's not an area where they have any particular regulatory uh, involvement. They certainly have a concern about transparency um, in, in reporting uh, to tenants. So the guidance requires local authorities to report to tenants on how the money is being used. And the regulator, I think, certainly has an interest in, making, in, in overseeing the extent to which we are are complying uh, with that uh, requirement. And I don't know that they, they currently have enough detail around those processes uh, to do to that function fully effectively. Okay. Well, we can cha challenge the regulator on their chap, chap door run approach uh, when it comes in. Entirely fair issue to raise, I wouldn't, wouldn't say. And, and uh, inappropriate in the moment, too. It was, it, it was very apposite, okay. very timely. Yeah, um, sorry. I think it is um, entirely appropriate an area for the regulator to be focusing on. I think it is in line with their statutory objective. Um, I think what's important is that a balance is found between what's affordable for tenants and still maintaining the financial viability of the organisation. And I suppose it's, it's what happens next in terms of what the regular issues in terms of guidance and how it engages with the sector from there. Well, if I can explore this notion of um, proportionality that uh, all of you have mentioned. Um, uh, I think it was yourself, Alan, that indicated that some of the issues that we're focusing on were trivial. Um, can, can you provide examples of this, and is there any views on, on, on how a more proportionate approach could be achieved? I think, as I said um, earlier on, there is a challenge in terms of providing specifics in terms of examples because people are understandably perhaps reluctant to be critical or, or make out that there is a problem with the regulator in, in terms of maybe being um, having their card marked or something along those lines. Whether that, That's just a perception. I, I don't think that's fair, but it does show that there is an issue that exists in terms of the relationship between the sector and how the regulator is perceived. Um, in our survey, it was like there were 57% of respondents that didn't think the regulator was performing its function in a proportionate manner. And I think in terms of a more general example, I, I think maybe the example that, that David gave earlier on, often we, we have found that um, the regulator will engage with a management committee um, but refuse to allow the staff to be present and refuse for any kind of minute to be taken of the meeting, which then leaves it, there, there is no transparency there in terms of, of what was actually said, and it's not exactly um, promoting good governance. Okay. And David, do you want Co to comment? Yes, a couple of comments. One, one, one uh, br broader about um, the regulators um, often makes quite a lot of having, uh, you know, saved or rescued some, some associations from insolvency, and perhaps that's then led to the association joining a, the group structure of, 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 another, of another association. I, I think the forum would feel comfortable to, to be reassured by the regulator that it has learned from some, some of the more difficult cases of the last few years when there, there is a sense within the sector that, that perhaps the regulator didn't spot things as soon as it might have done, uh, and, and although it may, may have been in there, it, it, you know, in the end, um, I think we'd, we'd, 
that, that sense of proportionality of, of, of maybe sometimes uh, deep, deep dealing with trivia but, but missing something much bigger going on somewhere, I, you know, we, we would feel comforted to, to, to know that they, they've maybe learnt some lessons. You know, how could we have seen that earlier so, a sort of approach um, uh, where, where there have been difficulties? But Alan, I, I agree with Alan that, that some of that sense of a lack of proportionality it, it, it isn't so much about what's being looked into. I mean, you know, qu qu quite often, when, you know, it's quite reasonable to suppose that when the regulator is engaged with an association, there may, there, there may be an issue that, that needs looking into. It may, be, may or may not become a serious issue. But it is that, it's the manner of the, of the communication. And in a sense, there's, there's an irony because the style and, and um, accessibility of the, the regulator's corporate information, the, the, the stuff it produces in newsletters and, and on its website, is, is really generally regarded as, as very high quality. But the manner of its communication style when it's engaging with a, a, partic with a particular association does, does seem disproportionate uh, um, it, 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 in a lot of cases. You know, whistleblowing is an example, and we may, we, may, we may or may not come to that later, but um, there, there is a sense that associations sometimes feel um, that they're guilty till proven innocent. Uh, and it just is, it's about manner, it's about approach, style, language, and it just sometimes, to, to our members, see, seems disproportionate uh, 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 as an approach when, when all that's happening at that particular stage is that an inquiry is being made, something is being looked into, and maybe, maybe there's, an, there's a feeling amongst members that there's an assumption of, uh, 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 you know, it, something is wrong, you know, and that, that, as I say, that sense of guilty to, to proved innocent is, is something that a number of our members feel. And what about local authorities, Tony, is it a similar I, I, perspective? No, not at all. I have, I have no sense of a feeling of, of disproportionate engagement from the, the regulator across the local authorities at all. The, the annual report says they, they visit 15 or engage with 15 of the 32 local authorities during the year. That's very nearly half the sector. It, it, th there's nothing coming back from my colleagues that says, you know, they feel like they're being pestered or they feel like it's inappropriate or it's unbalanced. With the local authorities, very clearly within the regulatory framework that's agreed uh, through the local area uh, arrangements, it's always proportionate. We always know they're coming. They were twice in Stirling uh, last year. Uh, we were well warned in advance. We were perfectly clear what it is they were coming to do, and they did what they were coming to do. There were some issues in their communication on, during the on-site and, and uh, uh, post-on-site uh, periods, but in terms of the proportionality, what they were looking at, I have no feel for those types of concerns. Uh, to be fair, the regulator engages with us in a much, on a much narrower range of issues, however. Okay, thank you for that, Tony. Uh, we could maybe explore some of the issues on transparency. Uh, Mary, would you like to ask me? And I wanted to explore in a bit more detail the issue of transparency because the 2010 Act requires the regulator to carry out its functions in a transparent manner. And there have been some criticism of the way the regulator carries out those functions, specifically from your organisation, um, David, um, who said that the, the regulator lacks transparency, frequently acts under the radar, leaving housing associations um, uncertain what to expect, how they should, be, how they should behave, the, the lack of um, a review mechanism where a, 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 an issue is, is disputed is, is also an issue. So, Perhaps if I started with you, David, if you could explain in a bit more detail your specific concerns around transparency, and then I'll move on to the other um, witnesses. I think when the 2010 Act was, it was introduced, um, as you'd expect of any legislation, it, it focused on formal statutory mechanisms for, for dealing with an issue, uh, both initially looking into it and then taking intervention action if that was deemed to be necessary. In the in the in the uh, um, you know in in the hindsight when we look back what what's developed or what's evolved with the regulator is with as I said earlier a good intention uh, a, a, an effort to use statutory formal mechanisms uh, a, a, as a last resort because it it, uh, it does trigger all kinds of uh, uh, interventions from for instance lenders which could which could sound the death knell for some associations if, if, if all their loans and covenants were, 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 were renegotiated, re repriced, you know, in the current climate. So there's, there's, there's genuine good intent there, I think, uh, on the regulator's part. But, 
but we then, uh, are, 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 we, we then have a, a lack of guidelines or rules of engagement about how, uh, what are the alternative ways in which if the regulator doesn't go down those formal routes uh, of how it does um, uh, act, how it engages with the associations. And, and you know, the regulators accept, recognised in, in, in recent meetings we've had with them that there is, a, there is a huge appetite in the sector for some more ground rules, for, for some more guidance. So I think we're, we're, we're making, uh, we're certainly making progress there. Um, the, obviously, the lack of a, 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 of a review appeals mechanism is, um, is, is something that, that we, I think we all agree has to be put right. And it, it, is, it is strange looking back to think that we, all of us, we, we, we allowed an act to be, to be uh, uh, um, passed w without, without that formal mechanism. And I'm, you know, we're probably all looking back and wondering how we, uh, how, how, how we managed that. I then go down to a micro level about, about transparency. That's a, what I've been talking about is transparency about how will the system work. Then when you go down to an individual engagement level, um, that, that, that there's certainly worrying aspects that, 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 we, that we would want to put right. Um, there does seem to be a sort of um, almost a kind of motto or mantra for, that, that's about nothing in writing. That does seem to be an approach that from the regulator in, in some of its engagement with individual associations about, about not putting enough in, in writing. And I realise we're off, we may well often be dealing with sensitive issues um, about, about associations, maybe about particular uh, uh, staff com committee members, financial issues, whatever. They, of course, there will be delicate issues. But nonetheless, um, to, 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 for, the for the committee of an association to be to be to be drawn into a meeting with the regulator, which isn't going to be noted or, 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 or minuted in any way, is is, is really problematic. It, we don't think that's in anyone's interest to, to to not be sure. And again, if somebody makes a whistleblowing allegation, which you know is is, is you know perfectly reasonable uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, of, of the system that we that we work in nowadays, and you'd expect people to be able to make whistleblowing allegations and for them to be looked into. It's surely appropriate. For the association to know, um, in, even in some paraphrased way, because obviously the, the, the regulator doesn't can't give away the the, the identity of, of, of somebody making those allegations, but just to summarise, these are the allegations, and we've heard from a number of associations that haven't had the benefit of that. And what then happens is, as you go through the process, as something's looked into, you're never quite sure what well, what were the original allegations, what's come along since. And, and that, that's simply a lack of transparency that would be helped by just a summary uh, of, of what the allegations were. Be helpful, thank you. Alan? Yeah, um, I think one of the key things that came out of the survey that we did was that um, there is a real appetite for an independent appeal mechanism. Um, with, there was two-thirds of respondents that felt that way. They did urge caution, though, because while it's crucial um, and it needs to be based on a clear rationale, there's, uh, that can't really, it can't add extra bureaucracy and it can't add an extra cost. Um, it needs to be um, very efficient. So uh, I think one of the best examples that's currently existing within a regulator and is um, the, in the office of the Scottish Char Charity Regulator. Um, they currently have an independent appeal mechanism that I think perhaps maybe it could be adapted to um, fit with the SHR. Thank you. Tony? I'm happy to agree that the, and some kind of appeals or review process around regulated decision making is, is entirely appropriate. I agree. It seems, uh, it seems odd that the system was set up without it. I, I don't imagine it requires uh, legislation for the uh, regulator to operate a review process. Maybe it does. I don't know. But I, but I agree it's a gap. Um, I, I also agree that there is a risk with review mechanisms that they become bureaucratic and bogged down and expensive. And I think there's something for the sector there to take responsibility for uh, on the issues that they choose to contest and the way they choose to contest them. In my previous life, I did see uh, landlords turning up with expensive lawyers to contest minor aspects of reports uh, on operational issues. And, and that's not a proportionate response from the sector. Uh, and I think, however, the, the core principle is, should there be a review mechanism? Absolutely, I think there should. Can I move on to talk a bit more about communication? Because the Scottish Housing Regulators Communications Research has found that stakeholders valued the informal dialogue that they, that they had. Um, and it follows on from the point, David, you were making about 
um, attending meetings and there's, there's no note of that meeting because um, tenants groups and stakeholders have emphasised the need to undertake more meaningful engagement and communication with, with tenants. But there is a balance between keeping things on an informal footing and moving things on to a more regulated um, way of, of doing things. So is there a conflict between improving transparency while keeping the benefits of informal dialogue, or does everything need to be put on a more regulated footing? It's, it's, it's an achievable outcome to get some ground rules in, in place um, that, that, would, that would enhance the, the current regulatory framework document that, that gives us all more sense of, of how some of the non, uh, say non statutory, because obviously the, everything they do is within their statutory powers, but some of the less formal mechanisms um, uh, of how engagement that, that, that does go down that le less formal route um, will work. Um, without necessarily thinking that the answer is, well, let's just do away with the informal and everything we, we do will be done in a more sort of uh, through formal uh, inquiry routes. I, I think it is an achievable outcome to, 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 to add a layer of, of guidance so that we know, we know what to expect. I would make one distinction. Um, my reading of the, of the, the stakeholder research uh, about its communications was, was that that focused more on how the regulator communicates more generally uh, through its you know, annual information, its annual reports, uh, of how it uh, communicates with the sector uh, overall, rather than what happens at an individual level when, when it's looking into something. So I think, I think and, and that, you know, I can understand that there was a sense of a good feedback about its, its corporate communications, as I've mentioned, uh, earlier that, 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 that you know that they've gen generally had a very consultative approach uh, to, 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 do, to doing things so I think I, my reading of the, of the stakeholder communications report was that it focused more on that side of things rather than what happens when the regulator goes in as it were I suppose even when the regulator does go in there is a balance between yeah. um, between keeping it informal and, and making it more um, official if you like but there will be different organisations, different individuals that value a different ap approach. So it would be, I think, quite a challenge to get a kind of one-size-fits-all for, for everyone because some organisations may value a more informal approach. Some organisations may want something a bit more formal. And, and I think it's about looking at what, what, are, the, <laughs> what are the more obvious uh, um, mm. outcomes to aim for in that. So whatever an individual association's preference about about style of communication you would think that any organization that's that's um on the receiving end of whistleblowing allegations could at least know what those allegations are in in, in summary so i think there are some there are some easy wins for us all to aim for that wouldn't upset that apple cart uh, in any disproportionate Being way more specific you could actually improve transparency it, well, it will improve transparency to have some rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Alan? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think um, some form of guidance on engagement in terms of the ground rules, in terms of what we will do, whether, that's, whether they are going to um, informally approach it or whether they're actually going to be specific in terms of this is how we're going to engage, I, I think that um, would be important and that would add transparency. Okay. Tony? I think the, the issue here is being clear about what is being recorded by way of information and assessment as a consequence of any particular engagement. It, 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 it can be managed by consent between the organisations or, or if it's a statutory intervention, it can be imposed by the regulator. However, at the end of it, however it is done, I think landlords need to be clear what the regulator has taken out of that, that, uh, that engagement and what they've recorded and what they will be using as a basis for future assessments. So we, we had a regulator visit uh, earlier on this year and we were not advised of any of you know, the conclusions that were drawn or the outcome from that. We got nothing back in, in writing. 
So I'm now unaware of what the regulator is taking into their conversations with other, other regulators. And I think that one, that at the very least, that one last detail needs to be there so we are clear. If it's an informal conversation, if it's a low-key intervention, if it doesn't amount to a formal inspection, nevertheless, what has the regulator learned by that? What's it recorded in its own files? What will it be taking forward in its broader assessment of the organisation? I think we need to be clear about that at the very least. Mm. And with guidance and a, a change in the code of practice, would that be enough to bring about the change you think would be beneficial, or would it need legislative change? I, I, I don't know that I'm fully equipped, but I, 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 this is in part it's about style and, I was, I, and, uh, and culture, and I suspect that could be done without statutory or, or even change to the guidance. David. Um, well, the, uh, obviously the, 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 the regulator says that there are codes of practice in place. It, it says that Chapter 6 and 7 of its, of its 2012 regulatory framework are the codes of practice on, on inquiries and on intervention respectively, although it do, you wouldn't know that from actually reading those documents. So I think they've a, they've a chance, without uh, amending primary legislation, they've a chance to amend that guidance now, uh, uh, both to cover some of the more uh, uh, informal mechanisms of, 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 in, of, of engagement that happen, and also to make much clearer than, than is the case at the moment that these chapters of the regulatory framework are indeed the statutory codes of, codes of practice. Alan. Um, as part of the uh, Regulatory Reform Act, there's, they're actually developing a code of practice for regulators in Scotland, so it could feed into that. I think it, as part of that, there is, um, they're looking at an independent appeals mechanism being statutory for all regulators in Scotland, so that maybe could be a way of doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Mary, Alec, you've got some further questions on communications. Indeed, I was going to cover the issue of communications, and we seem to have spoken about little else so far. <laughs> However, the, there are a couple of points uh, that would be interesting to develop. Uh, first of all, the regulator's communications research highlighted that both tenant groups and strategic stakeholders felt there was a need for the Scottish Housing Regulator to undertake more meaningful engagement and communication with tenants uh, and provide simple, concise information to tenants on its role and on the charter. Uh, what do you think they need to do specifically to improve their communication with tenants? Certainly, they've set up a, a, a national tenants panel, um, well, it's of tenants and service users, which I think is, is a good start. Um, one issue there might be around that is, is I think there tends to be specific tenants that the, the regulator always engages with. Um, so perhaps maybe finding out... Indeed, indeed. And I think that, that that's pro more down to, I think, there are tenants that are more willing to engage than others. I think that's just, just the way of it. Um, so if there's a way of finding, uh, of engaging with maybe the harder to reach groups, the groups that maybe aren't as engaged with it, because I don't think there is a great awareness of the Scottish Housing Regulator amongst tenants in Scotland. Um, I, I don't think that many of your Joe blogs um, would, would know who the Scottish Housing Regulator were. Mm -hmm. um, th there is the, the opportunity for tenants to report significant performance failures directly through the regulator. And I think some of the, the guidance on that was a little um, perplexing for tenants and to understand exactly what that meant, what, a, what, what is a significant performance failure. Uh, that, that needed to be explained in more, um, in terms that the ten tenants could understand. Um, I think that's pretty much, I, I think that's the area that they, they need to look at in terms of engaging the tenants, actually reaching groups out with just the normal people that they contact. Mm -hmm. I think the last year has, has uh, in fact, the last few months have, have seen a, re a, a real step forward for tenants in the sense of that the, 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 the um, publication of um, charter information, both for, for individual tenants about their own landlord, but of course then about uh, the cross-sector uh, information ha has probably, um, uh, or, it, or is it, we're on a journey now to that leading to tenant, tenants being more aware that this is what the, the regulator does. It looks at how their landlord performs. And some of that will be a lot more visible and meaningful to tenants than what happens with, with, with governance issues or financial issues. I'm not saying those are not important, but they're less visible, they're less obvious to tenants' everyday lives. So I think that in terms of the broader engagement with the, with the whole body of tenants, there's probably greater awareness 
uh, now than even three or four months ago before the charter information came out. So in, in that sense, it's a, it's a step forward. It, might, it, might, it should raise the profile of the regulator amongst tenants in general. But I wouldn't, I'd be nervous about speaking on behalf of, of tenants as, as, a, as, a, as a body representing landlords. Because, and, and I know you've obviously tried to, to get tenant, tenant interests uh, um, uh, involved in, 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 in this uh, uh, look at the annual report. So I, I hesitate to, 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 to offer an answer on behalf of tenants. Mm. It's certainly an experience that uh, I've had out in the field talking to tenants uh, in a fairly formal setting, that uh, there are a few individuals with very strong opinions. And the question I'm left with in my mind is if they represent tenants as a whole or if they simply represent their own opinion. Uh, I think we've got a lot to learn on both sides about how we consult at that level. The, a slightly different subject. The, it was mentioned a few moments ago that there's a draft regulator's code of practice. Uh, and it says that regulators must communicate effectively with those they regulate to build up relationships and mutual understanding which helps to avoid and mitigate uh, or mitigate disputes. To what extent do you think the Office of the Housing Regulator uh, currently operates with that principle in mind and what, or what changes do you think would need to be made in order to make that requirement fit? I give, I give what I honestly think is a, 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 bal a balanced answer, some positive and, and, and less positive. But, I mean, the, the regulators sought, for instance, to publish a series of Governance Matters publications in which it looks at, obviously anonymously, at, at specific cases where it, it has intervened and identified uh, uh, issues that have had to be addressed. And it's trying to look at what, what the lessons, the wider lessons of those are, and, and, and that is a very direct, constructive way of getting stuff out there, of, of actually enabling everyone to look at that and see what lessons can be learned. S some, of the, some of those uh, uh, Governance Matters publications have perhaps erred slightly on the side of, um, uh, you know, the learning points that come from it, which, you know, many of them are, ve are very useful, but sometimes there's been a sense of... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, for instance, ad addressing committee members and saying, you know, uh, 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 are, you, are you sure you're, you know, you're not being shafted by the, by the senior officer and, and, and how, you know, how sure? And of course, committees and chairs need, need, to, need to have that right governance relationship with senior staff. But there's maybe sometimes been an undercurrent that, that portrays the whole sector uh, as, as, as being one in which senior staff are trying to keep things from, from, their, from, from their committee. So, again, I think sometimes the, the tone hasn't been achieved right, but, but the sense of um, um, promoting some, some uh, uh, sharing of, of information, sharing of practice has, has, been, has been good, certainly within, within publications like Governance Matters. The, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I do think there has been a, an improvement because, I, because I think initially, when the regulator became independent of government in April 2012, there was a sense, perhaps, of trying to flex its muscles, trying to show that it was who, who it was. Um, but I, I think that there is more positive communication coming from the regulator now. I, I think they maybe they recognised themselves that they needed there be a shift. Um, well, for instance, Section Two of the um, their annual, or sorry, their annual report is RSLs are well governed and in good financial health. So they are at least making an effort to now promote the fact that the sector is, on the whole, um, well managed. Um, but I think that the best example, maybe, of negative communication that has come from the regular is the the governance match publications that um, David referenced there. Um, per perhaps the, if there was more of a focus on good practice in the sector as well to balance it out. That, that would help the tone. Mm. It's just an observation, and I'll, I'll make it and give you the opportunity to comment on it if you wish. And that is that I get the impression that the, the broad issue that exists here is probably an issue of trust. But that if I read anything from your comments, the situation is improving rather than deteriorating over time. Would that be fair? I think it's a mixed 
uh, what our members report is, 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 is a mixed picture. We, we, the, 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 there are examples we, we, we've, we've heard about uh, that, that, that suggest um, some awareness amongst some I, I, I regulatory staff um, or, or, of, of the concerns that, that, that have been expressed within the sector, um, but um, for, you know, and, and as, 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 as in terms of our meetings with the regulator, there's definitely been a recognition that, as I said, there's an appetite for more information about 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 um, what the rules of engagement should be. But nonetheless, what's a bit more worrying is is that some of the we're still getting, you know, including right up until the last few days, we're still getting examples of direct, you know, engagement uh, 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 to housing association level with the regulator, which, which, which gives us cause for concern. So I think it's, it's probably, uh, it, it, it's, we, we, we would be much more reassured if we were getting less of, less of this type of, of feedback, you know, of, of the type, for instance, as I referred to earlier about uh, associations coming under intense pressure that when they appoint, and it is the association that appoints in almost all cases, an independent uh, investigator where this is where this is deemed necessary but coming under intense pressure to choose the one that the regulator wants it to choose and th you know that we we've had uh, instances of that right up until very very recently so um, I, I i you know it would be nice to come back in in six months time and feel that we're getting we're hearing less of that of those kind of uh, 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 pressure tactics if, if if you like so um i'm not yet in a position to say it's an improving situation echo what David's saying there. Um, given this, the survey that we conducted, it, it was still 57% that didn't feel the regulator was performing in a proportionate manner, so that would need to be a lot lower before we could really say that things were moving completely in the right direction. Um, I, th I think there is, as I said earlier, a, re a reluctance for people to raise their head above the parapet. You, you said about mistrust, and I think that is definitely there. I mean, e even in our survey, a third of respondents wanted to remain anonymous, even to respond to us in talking about the regulator, which I think shows that sort of culture that's developed. Um, which is why, again, to, to reiterate, I, I think it might be helpful if, if the committee were so minded to, um, we, we would offer a Chatham House meeting to hear specific examples from the sector in a more sort of um, safe environment, if you, if you like. If, if I may, one or two comments on, on, on a range of issues that were raised there. First, on the issue of the, the uh, extent to which the, the uh, regulator is, is communicating directly with tenants and, is, and tenants are aware of the existence of the regulator. I think there is a simple issue of proportionality and cost involved in that. There are half a million tenants in Scotland. Half of them at least don't have access to the internet on a regular basis, uh, certainly not in fixed internet in their own home. Using sort of traditional ways or ways which in other sectors work very well with, with, the, with tenants, with the uh, service users aren't going to work as well and I think landlords need to take some responsibility and need to have that conversation with the regulator about how we make the regulator more visible uh, and we probably need to have a bit more structured approach to that but I think we have to accept some responsibility for if there is a lack of visibility then we have to accept some resp responsibility for that. On the issue of building relationships funnily enough one of the things that is most likely to build a relationship with uh, is, is informal contact uh, and issues have already been raised about uh, informal contact but it is the ability to pick up the phone and talk to somebody is is the action that will leave you in a position where you feel you can begin to trust them and to the extent that that isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do in the world then I think that uh, a change in that approach so that, that, that that area might make a difference as far as the local authority sector is concerned I do not think there is a the, the extent to which the regulator is trusted has improved significantly in the last couple of years. I think our experience around the uh, um, housing options thematic was a very, very positive one. The outcome of that, I thought, was excellent. I think, notwithstanding some of the delays, the overall engagement was very positive, and I think it left a much uh, better feeling across the sector uh, when they saw that report and they had those conversations than perhaps had been, been previously the case, and that has helped significantly. But I also think the issue of trust is one that, uh, that sits on both sides. Regulation and inspection in particular is essentially underpinned all the time by, by conflict. The regulator is there to do something in particular, not necessarily to the benefit of the regulated organisation. And I think we have to accept and acknowledge the nature of that relationship as we start to understand the extent to which we trust and the way in which we re respond to the regulator. 
I do not have a problem with the regulator the way it does its business. I do not have a problem with the personnel in that organisation uh, or the way in which they engage with me or the local authority sector. I, I, they have a particular job to do. It isn't always going to be something that we want to hear. Sometimes we just need to deal with that. Um, but in the end, there's always going to be that risk and there will always be that element of conflict that underlies the relationship. We need to acknowledge and accept it. I'd just like to add one thing about that issue of trust, which is it's, I think it's very telling that a number of members have said... Uh, to the forum that in the past, if they were dealing with an issue, uh, uh, it could have been financial, it, 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 it could have been about you know, a, a development issue, a piece of land, something, something they wanted to do. In the past, they might have picked up the phone to the regulator and, and passed it by them, had a discussion about dealing with the issue. And, though, and a number of members have said to us now, we'd think twice now about doing that. And I, I, I think that says something about a changing relationship there that, that perhaps was once seen as more supportive um, than, than, than perhaps it is, it is now. Yeah, yeah and I, I think that's fair to say we've had a lot of contact from members that have said exactly the same thing that, that David's just outlined there. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Gordon, I think you've got a couple of points. You want. I've got a couple of points. I was going to ask you about Governance Matters publications specifically, um, but we've touched upon that already. So the, the one thing I would like to ask specifically, David, at this, at this stage is um, you've commented a couple of times about the tone of communications. How would you see the, the guidance and, and tone changing so that it doesn't create the perception that, uh, as you've said in your written evidence, that the senior officers shouldn't be trusted or they aren't sharing sufficient information with committees, etc. How would you see that changing? I think one of the ways is, 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 is the, the um, aspect Alan just mentioned, which is that if the Governance Matters publications over time can perhaps uh, uh, include a greater focus on... on, on on good, good practice. Now, the regulator may say, well, we don't go in where there's good, good practice. In a sense, that's not our, our concern. Um, and perhaps the, yeah, it, it, you could argue that some good practice is implicit in lessons to be learned from, from, from poorer uh, practice. But again, it is, is just about um, a greater recognition, such as, such as is in their annual report, but, 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 but didn't feel it came out of the Governance Matters publications, that fundamentally the sector is a healthy sector. You, you wouldn't get that feeling necessarily from reading you know, the, the tone and language of, of some of the Governance Matters publications. But I think um, the, um, the sense of... Um, uh, 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 you know, uh, so many... Uh, brownie points could be scored by just you know, getting more down as to what we can expect, what are some of the rules of engagement. They can never cover every situation. No, we don't expect guidance to do that. But I think that will, that will help uh, those associations when, that, when they are in engagement feel less threatened, less defensive, less uncertain uh, about what to expect. So that, you know, in, in a sense, there's such a, a major gain, a big win there uh, uh, in terms of overall... Uh, communications and trust if, if, if we can all understand better what to expect when engagement comes. How, how widespread is the concern about, about the tone? Because uh, if my understanding is correct, um, the House and Regulator held a number of uh, Governance matter, uh, Matters events, uh, which had um, in the region of about 113 associations that went along. 81% took part in the feedback exercise and it was overwhelmingly positive about um, the best practice, training and support, etc. So how widespread is the concerns that you're raising? Again, I think there's a distinction here that the, 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 the excellent feedback that, that, that we, we also had from, from uh, committee members that, that attended those those sessions was, was about how, how, how good those training sessions were and what, what, it, what it helped them to understand uh, as, as committee members of housing associations. That's different from, from feedback about individual engagement where there is an issue. That, that, that feedback was about the quality of the training uh, that, that was received and, and, it, and it, 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 was, it was obviously very, it went down very well. But that's quite different from what's happening on an individual engagement level. And do any of the other panel members have any concerns about the Guidance, Ma uh, Guidance Matters publications? 
Governor I, Smatter, sorry. Yeah, I think, as I said earlier, I, I think that there's definitely a place for learning from others' mistakes. I think that is, is what the focus of the Governance Matters publications have been. But because they're consistently um, negative examples, it just gives a perception of the sector that perhaps we'd be looking to avoid. Um, so maybe a bit more of a focus on best practice examples, which people could also learn from and borrow um, um, from what people are doing well, I think would be very helpful in changing that tone. Okay. I can offer an external observation, if you like, since the local authority sector is not necessarily involved in, in the conversations around governance that go on between the regulator and, and the uh, RSLs. In the local authority sector, we feel the presence of our elected members on a daily basis. The scrutiny that they offer and the challenge that they bring is a critical part of everything that we do. And as senior officers, you think about it regularly through the day. It's, it's part of what you do. Our impression, my impression, and one which is, which is uh, um, strengthened by conversations with senior officers in, in the housing association movement, is that governors on housing association boards don't play a similar function. They are not present as a challenge to decisions uh, and behaviours uh, and outcomes in the way that local authority uh, elected members are. To the extent that the regulator has to either get board members to a place where they can be that presence or be that presence itself, it seems to me that it's doing a very useful job. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, can we... Um wrap up the questions with a series of issues that uh, we haven't touched on as yet. Mark, please. Thanks, Kavina. Um, if I can just touch on appeals, you've all stated um, that you think an, an appeals mechanism should be brought in, but just briefly, are you able to say how that lack of an appeals mechanism has impacted on um, social landlords and tenants? It just goes against natural justice. I mean, uh, when landlords make decisions in, in relation to, to tenants or applicants uh, or, 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 or homeless people, then you know, you, they, 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 they expect those, those decisions from time to time to be, to be challenged uh, through a range of mechanisms up to and including the, 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 the courts. It, 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 it just leaves associations... Uh, it, in an incredibly, you know, exasperated position when, when, when they feel that there are, um, uh, you know, that their, their, their level of engagement, that the formal level of engagement, if it's changed from low to medium or medium to high, uh, you know, the, these these things have have big, big implications for associations and their finances, their relationships with lenders, and and if you if you can't seek a review, if you can't ultimately appeal that, uh, it, it, it's it's an incredibly dispiriting and and, 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 and sort of, um, you know, it's the opposite of, of, of empowerment. It's, it's, a, it's a very vulnerable position to be, to be in when it, it, if, if, if an association uh, strongly believes that, 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 in effect, there's been a mis miscarriage of justice. It just goes against all, as I say, principles of natural justice that, there, that, that there's no appeal system there. Okay, thanks for that. Um, David, your organisation um, in particular have been critical about the regulator's requirement um, to consider the future of an RSL when uh, a senior member of staff has moved or, or retired. Are you able to give um, more detail about um, why you have um, those concerns? Yes, our, our concern is with, with, with that sense of, of, of across the board, you know, this, this is a rule that has, has, has applied... Um, you know, uh, in the vast majority of cases where uh, the the uh, retiral or departure of, of, of a senior officer, uh, uh, according to the guidance on notifiable, notifiable events, um, A, triggers, you know, you've got to carry out an, an options appraisal, and B, and explicitly in the guidance at the moment, that is the reference to that options appraisal, including being expected to include looking at your, the, op, the options for marrying up with another association in some kind of structural um, relationship. The, that reference to, to having to do that with, or being expected to do that within options appraisal is especially threatening to smaller community-based associations that prize their, 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 their independence. And, and um, we've been encouraged in the last uh, uh, few weeks uh, by uh, uh, um, indications from the regulator that they, 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 they see fit to review that 
reference, to review the guidance overall, such that, as we've argued for a long time, if an association is in good health and can prove that, good business plan, good finances in place, the mere act of the senior officer leaving shouldn't trigger, shouldn't trigger anything if, if, if it's a well-run uh, association. We'd completely accept that if, if there are real problems within an association and the senior officer leaves, that, that, that needs to trigger something, something more uh, in depth. But where things are running fine and that can be proven to the regulator's satisfaction, um, that, that, that there shouldn't be any need uh, for an options appraisal um, and nor indeed the references to the potential for structural partnerships. And we're, we're, we're reassured um, that, that the regulator's minded to, to review that guidance and change that shortly. Okay, aside from that reference to the, the structural review and um, potentially threatening smaller um, housing associations, do you see any positive um, benefits from that guidance for um, an, option, an option appraisal process from any, any turnover in senior staff? I think when, senior, when, a member, when a senior staff member leaves the, you know, an association, any association, is, it, you, know, you would expect it to be looking at what's the staff complement, um, is, there, is, there is there any change in terms of staff roles that would be needed, you know, what would be the job description of, of, of an incoming uh, director. You'd expect any organisation when senior staff leave, uh, not just at the top tier, but, but a, a, a number of... Uh, uh, tiers particularly towards towards the senior end to, to 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 be to be doing good just good housekeeping like that but it doesn't need to threaten in any way or refer to the independence of of, of the organization okay. and finally if i can um, just wrap up the discussion just there have been a number of concerns um that all three of you have, have mentioned about the the regulator just to ask what level of discussion there's, there's been about those concerns, um, if there's been any, um, what's the, the outcome of any discussions been, if there's been any movement on behalf of the regulator to meeting any of those concerns? The conversations going on between LHO, the Scottish Housing Failure Network and the regulator have been, have been fairly positive. I mean, the meetings take place on a regular basis and I think we feel there is forward progress on the strength of that relationship and the trust between between the, within the sector and to, towards the regulator. Can, can I just go back, if you'll forgive me, to the point you were making earlier on about the guidance around the uh, option appraisal in the event of a departure of a senior officer? The, the regulator, Scottish Housing Regulator, regulates housing associations. It does not regulate the sector. And I think that is the, um, in some senses, the elephant in the room and the gap that that guidance is pointing at. The regulator is asking organisations to think about their position within the wider sector and the extent to which that position is efficient, effective and in the best interests of tenants. I think the difficulty is it's asking individual organisations to do that and there isn't a mechanism to look at the sector more generally. There is a question, I mean, to put it crudely, why are there 52 directors of housing in Glasgow? There is a question to get asked about the structure of the sector. It doesn't necessarily mean it's good or it's bad, but it brings with it costs um, in the way in which it's currently organised and there isn't a way in which that issue can be debated. I think the regulator in that guidance is pointing to that conversation, but it has no power and no locus to drive that, that debate any further. I think there is a need for that debate to get had, and I hope, uh, both in relation to the, to the RSLs and the local authority sector, that once the con current constitutional conversations are settled down and we get a chance to move on to the necessary organisation of public services, which presumably will take place at some point thereafter, there will also be a conversation about the provision of public housing uh, and the, the balance in the sector, both the local authority and the RSLs, which I think that conversation points to. I've absolutely got to just break off from answering the question now and, and, and respond to, uh, to a couple of points that Tony's made. I hope that I won't take too long over that and forgive me for uh, depart. I will come to the, the, the question about, about uh, discourse with the, with the regulator. Um, the reason there may be 50 uh, uh, associations and cooperatives in, 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 in Glasgow, um, you know, look at what's happened on the ground. Look at the way in which communities have changed, in individual communities that are quite different from the communities uh, up the road. And, you know, it, it, we, we constantly as a forum, and, you know, we have to be careful not to get paranoid about it, but we constantly, you know, th 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 this is the sort of stuff you can hear from, the, from whether it's from larger associations or from the local authority sector, sometimes from politicians, sometimes from, 
from civil servants, that notion that somehow there are simply too many associations. When we published a, a report six or eight weeks ago that showed what our how our members were performing on the Charter, um, we came higher than larger housing associations and, and 26 landlord local authorities on every single of the main indicators uh, that, that, that the Charter looks at. And the rents were, 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 were somewhat lower uh, than, than, than um, other, other associations in Scotland. So we kind of think we're doing something right, uh, we're providing responsive services, but also being, being that community anchor body that makes other things happen in that community, and that, that that's what's been earned, that's what's been gained from having you know, individual associations, some of which uh, are indeed very small. And my honest view is that, is that the local authority sector perhaps needs to spend less time worrying about the size of small housing associations and looking at how long it takes to carry out emergency repairs for some of, it, for some of its tenants. Um, I also, uh, I, I would like to comment on Tony's suggestion that the, the balance, the governance balance, is wrong throughout the sector. There will be cases, and the, the regulators identified cases, where it believes there's too much power in the staff and not enough power within the committee, but I would, I would argue that those are uh, not, not, uh, that's not a, 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 to tar the whole sector with the same brush, and that, and that there, is, there is a very challenging relationship uh, 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 where, where, where committees very much challenge senior staff. I'm not saying there isn't scope for more of that to happen in certain cases, but I would to, to say that the sector is characterised by staff ruling, ruling their committees and not being challenged, I, I would have to argue that. And I'll finish, because I know I've talked far too much, um, by saying that we're very encouraged by the discourse with the regulator in recent months. We've met three times now. We're meeting again tomorrow with the regulator and, and, and we certainly uh, uh, um, feel that there's, a, there's an open dialogue there and we hope to make progress on the issues that we've outlined. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on the options appraisal stuff as well. I, I think um, it's important to note that the sector is not one size fits all. That's, that's crucial to note. And I think any sort of process that the organisation undertakes needs to be proportionate to the size of the organisation. Um, one thing that we have come across is there have been cases where the regulator is dictating which consultant that the organisation has to use. And I don't think that's really appropriate in terms of um, how, how the, how the organisation itself is going to take it forward. It should be down to them who they select to actually go about it. Um, but in terms of the um, SFHA and the SHR's dialogue, um, we do have regular meetings, um, our, our chief executives meet regularly, and also we do have regular board-to-board -board meetings, so there's, there is a dialogue there and um, regular communication. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your evidence this morning, um, sometimes entertaining even. Um, uh, so I now would call a suspension of the meeting to allow witnesses to leave the room and we can move into private session.